Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Abdulaziz Ahmed from the John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. Dr. Ahmed completed medical school at the Jordan University of Science and Technology in Jordan and pursued orthopedic residency at the Hamad Medical Corporation in Doha, Qatar. Currently, Dr. Ahmed is a shoulder surgery fellow at the John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore. He's been on the JBJ's resident spotlight for implementing the Robert Buckholz resident journal club. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Abdul Aziz Ahmed from Baltimore. Oji Abdul. Dr. and thank you for having me on this talk. It's really a pleasure to uh, talk about lateral clavicle fractures to the audience and present uh, my technique as well. Um, uh, so um, what I'm gonna talk today is briefly about introduction, how to uh, evaluate clavicle fractures, lateral clavicle fractures, and treatment options, uh, kind of also a decision-making process. And finally, I'll present a surgical technique that I prefer uh, specifically for this fracture pattern. So I have nothing to disclose. So lateral, lateral clavicle fractures um, occur at a much lesser rate than the mid-shaft clavicle fractures, and these are rates from the literature. Uh, so you can see it's about 12 to 26% compared to 80% on the mid-shaft. Um, uh, and if we, we should always review uh, the AC joint and the CC ligaments in terms of anatomy, they're per pertinent to the surgery. So the AC joint uh, provides for us uh, horizontal stability in the horizontal plane, but the CC ligaments uh, provide the vertical plane stability. And uh, we know there are two ligaments, the trapezoid and the conoid. You can see the green ligament that uh, lights up on the right. That's the trapezoid. Usually it is the most lateral based one. It's about two centimeters medial to the AC joint. And then uh, you get the conoid, which is about four uh, centimeters medial to the AC joint. And of course we do have a uh, dynamic stability uh, provided by the deltoid and uh, the trapezius as well uh, to the joint and the fracture pattern as well. So in terms of evaluation, uh, th these patients usually have a direct fall uh, on the distal clavicle or just a direct blow. And in terms of evaluation, we should always keep in mind these can be high level injuries um, and you need to evaluate for other shoulder girdle fractures, ribs, spine and chest. And in terms of skin uh, uh, physical examination, you have to pay attention to skin tinting. That's usually an absolute indication, can indicate an impending open fracture over that area. Uh, also shoulder range of motion and uh, neurovascular examination. It is not uncommon to have uh, injury to a suprascapular uh, nerve as well. So that's a very important point. Um, in terms of radiographic evaluation, uh, because that's a shoulder injury, don't forget to order a shoulder trauma series through AP axillary. Uh, Zanka view, uh, which is about 10 to 15 degrees uh, cephalic tilt, might be helpful, especially if you're looking into an intraarticular involvement. Uh, and it's always helpful to do uh, bilateral clavicle radiographs that can help you in comparison and evaluate the displacement. And in terms of classification, uh, we know the near classification, which classifies them into about, um, uh, we have uh, five classifications. You can see the main important thing about this is to determine whether a fracture is stable or not. So stable fractures usually are one and three, and the unstable ones are two. You can see 2A, 2B, and five. And so as the fracture goes medial to the ligaments or disrupts one of the CC ligaments, the fracture becomes unstable. And that what happens in a type two and a type uh, five fracture. Other than that, the one and three usually are stable fractures. And what's the implications of this is that the lateral clavicle fractures, if you wanna compare them to the medial side, uh, they tend to have more incidence of non-union. And we have this classic study by Robinson in uh, 2004, uh, showing us the predictors of non-union. You can have lack of cortical apposition, female gender, presence of comminution, advancing age, and uh, they found specifically displaced lateral end fractures. And the rate is about 28 to 44 percent in unstable near fractures. So that's the type two and your type five. And uh, the symptomatic non-union is rare. So not all non-union is symptomatic. And that is very important in decision making, because if you have somebody who's relatively older and less active, you might be inclined to do non-operative treatment compared to operative. And in terms of treatment, we know classically, as we study through orthopedics, you have your absolute and relative 
uh, indications for absolute indications of course surgery is going to be for up and fractures contenting subclavian vascular injury floating shoulders and symptomatic non-unions and malunions for relative we know classically polytrauma that facilitates rehabilitation and brachial plexus palsy uh, might be also managed relatively uh, operative so there is controversy about this because about 66 percent recover spontaneously but if we look just by the fracture itself my algorithm is we look at fracture stability we go back to the near classification so if it's a type two or five and in a patient who is relatively younger and active i will be inclined to do surgery if the fracture was stable that's one or three or let's say somebody who's 80 year old with that kind of fracture and inactive i'll tend toward the non-operative treatment so these are your types which is the type two and the type five these are, are the unstable fractures so what are the treatment options that can we have surgically? There are numerous. So there are many techniques that are described in the literature. So you can have uh, locking plates that are pre-contoured or recon plates. You can have uh, hook plates as well. Uh, you can do a tension band with K-wires, uh, standalone screws, CC screws. Um, you can just do pens uh, across the fracture from the acromion uh, using also an intramedullary screw and uh, this is the coracoclavicular suture-based fixation, which is my personal preference. So when you look at the literature in terms of union rates, I think when you treat these fractures surgically, your problem is not the union rate. Rather, your problem is the complication rate. So the union rates in one meta-analysis that published recently, it found that most of these fixations, they have no statistical difference in terms of union rates, unless if you want to look here in the numbers, probably tension banding K-wiring has the one with uh, a lower relatively union rate of 92%. Other than that, when they did the statistical comparison, there is no difference. So in my opinion, the optimal treatment for these fractures could, it depends on several things. A surgeon preference, it's how you trained, what, what worked in your hands, and also lateral clavicular fragment bone stock, for example, uh, if you have a very comminuted fracture, a pre-contoured plate is not going to work because you have nothing to fix it with. But a hook plate might work better in that case. And, and also complication profile. If you look at the implant removal rates, are uh, very important because these are subsequent preventable procedures. Uh, if you theoretically reduce your um, symptomatic hardware, uh, AC joint or rotator cuff issues are a concern and loss of production hardware failure. So having these factors in mind this can really help you with determining uh, the optimal treatment for this condition so one option as i said the locking plates they can be in different forms uh, for example you can see in the top image that's a pre-contoured plate for the lateral end and reconstruction plates such as the plates you can find in the such as the, the trauma surgeons using the establum so uh, advantages they're robust mechanical stability. In biomechanical studies, they have been proven to have the superior biomechanical stability. The drawbacks, they have potential hardware removals and the rate in the literature is about 16 to 37%. And they require sufficient bone because the lateral end of the plate has to be fixed within bone. So if you get a comminuted fracture, this option is difficult to apply. And, uh, and of course, if you're in a limited environment and you don't have any of these plates, you can use 3.5 uh, pelvic reconstruction plates. They can work as well. But the technical tip in, in this when using these implants is that you need at least three bicortical screws in the lateral fragment. So when you use a recon plate, sometimes it might be less robust than using the pre plate. So you might need to add an additive fixation to a recon plate, such as tight ropes, using maybe a coracoclavicular screw. Um, more than that, the hook plates. Uh, so if you have insufficient bone, uh, the hook plate is going to be uh, a better alternative compared to the pre-contoured looking locking plate. So, and this is how it looks like, and it goes under the acromion. So um, the routine, you need to do hardware removal routinely for all of these because they lead to AC joint arthritis, osteolysis, and they have significant subacromial complications, impingement and rotator cuff tears. So, and uh, so these are the drawbacks of uh, this uh, implant. Um, other than that, you can do, as we said, a tension band construct, but in the literature, it has notably higher complications. It, hardware failure has been reported up to 62%. So it's something I don't prefer personally. 
And uh, you can also do standalone screws. It could be intramedullary. It could be a CC screw as well, which re requires implant removal. And it can be complicated by screw breakage. So for me, my preferred technique is doing a coracoclavicular suture-based fixation. This can be done completely standalone. This is the only thing that you fix the fracture with uh, by fixing the coracoid to the clavicle. And, um, and also it can be achieved with different constructs uh, by using rope, by using a suture, by even allograft or, or autograft that has been described. Or you can even combine that with a plate. So do a plate fixation and do that if you prefer. And this can be done in two different ways. It can be done open or maybe arthroscopic assisted as well. So the advantages of using uh, coracoclavicular suture-based fixation is reducing implant removals. There is nothing to remove and uh, useful and insufficient bone stock. So if you get a totally comminuted lateral fragment, uh, you can put a plate on it. And uh, the hook plate has a lot of issues with the subacromial impingement. It also has problem with rotator cuff. So this can be a really good option. But the theoretical risks, you can have coracoid fractures, especially if you drill um, uh, a bigger hole, osteolysis as well. You get like uh, the sewing action of the rope into the coracoid. And of course, risk to nearby structures if you're not careful medially to the coracoid, you drift into the uh, brachial plexus and the musculocutaneous nerve as well. So this is my preferred technique, uh, which is the open coracoclavicular uh, fixation. So what, how I reach the coracoid is that through the same incision, I do minimal dissection to the coracoid. And radiographically, I do insert an anchor. So I insert two anchors, one in the coracoid, which is going to fix the clavicle to the coracoid and a coracoacromial um, coracoclavicular fixation and suture buttons. So my technique is described in, um, uh, we've published it in, uh, uh, on Vumidi as well and as an article. And I have to credit my mentor in Qatar, um, Dr. Ali Darwish, who's, uh, who taught me how to do this technique. Um, so uh, this is a case presentation. Um, so this was a 24 year old male that we operated on. He was a motorcyclist. Uh, on evaluation, skin was intact, normal vascular deficit. Our indication to operate was is it was an unstable fracture, and this was a young, active individual. So uh, what we did, uh, surgical positioning, what we use is a standard table uh, with the head of the belt elevated about 30 degrees. Um, and uh, our skin incision is a saber cut incision, so centered over uh, the coracoid and uh, you can see on the image on the left coracoid and then over the fracture site and we mark the coracoid the acromion and uh, so you take the, sk the skin incision um, and down subcutaneous tissues then you uh, will, you will have you will be on top of the clavicle and then you should create a flap anterior and posterior which is a deltoid trapezial facial flap uh, and after that after you uh, visualize the fracture site such as Treating any fracture, you clear the fracture site from debris, from interposed tissues, and you gotta evaluate uh, fracture reduction. And uh, after this is done, what we do is uh, we dissect minimally. So in front of the clavicle is the coracoid. So we dissect minimally there by using blunt dissection that can be done. And you can localize the coracoid. And after that's done, um, by using serum guidance, we confirm our position with the drill over the coracoid itself. And what we use is the 4.5 drill bit. And uh, we insert our preference with this technique is using a BioCourse Crew 5.5 uh, anchor um, with fiber wire. And at this, so you can see in the image on the right. So this is what we do is that um, we drill the coracoid and we insert an anchor there, but we do a supplemental fixation by inserting an anchor into the acromion. And we, what our aim is to achieve an acromial and a clavicular fixation. So we have two limbs. So one anchor is in the coracoid into the clavicle and another one in the acromion and into the clavicle. And so this is not, described as a standard procedure in the literature, but this is our preferred technique. And this can be done through the same approach. If it's extensile, you can do an extensile flap and reach the acromion, or it can be done through a separate stab incision. So what we do is a 3.5 millimeter drill bit, and um, we insert uh, the same corkscrew. And we use a smaller drill bit, and just because the bone is much softer on that end. Um, so, and the rationale to do this is that, in our opinion, why we add the uh, a chromoclavicular fixation 
is that in our experience is the medial clavicular fragment displaces almost always posteriorly. You can see in this video, we tried to reduce it by pulling uh, by pushing anterior on it with the homen. So it's almost always going posterior. So if we fix the coracoid with the clavicle, we restore vertical stability, but you might have residual horizontal stability that can compromise your fixation. That's why we add the, let's say, the horizontal stability with the acromion. And this has also been described in the literature. So this is a, a study using CT scans on 35 patients and uh, with unstable lateral clavicle fracture. So similar to our indication. And they found, and as you can see in this image, is that 94.6% have posterior displacement, which sometimes it can be um, um, not usually visualized because all what we focus on is the vertical displacement, but there is a component of a posterior displacement that we address. So after we have put an anchor in the acromion and the coracoid, we create the bone tunnels. So we create two bone tunnels within the medial clavicular fragment. So that's by using a 2.5 millimeter drill bit and usually they're one centimeter apart. And what we do is that fiber wires from the coracoid, they, they're passed through the medial tunnel and the, and the acromial uh, fiber wires, they're passed through the lateral uh, tunnel within the medial clavicular fragment. So after this is done, what we do, you need to ensure that you reduce the uh, fracture before tying the sutures. So you pass two endo buttons on top of each group of sutures, but you have to ensure that reduction has been achieved before tying them off. Otherwise, uh, you, you will not have sufficient stability or proper fracture reduction. So in this video, we pass an endo button for each limb, and then we tie uh, the sutures. And finally, what you get is a Caraco, uh, a clavicular fixation with uh, by using only sutures and also at the same time by using an acromio um, a clavicular fixation. So you can see in this image on the right, you get the sutures going from the coracoid into the medial clavicular fragment from the acromion to the to the to the lateral hole of the medial clavicular fragment, and then they're tied down. And you can see here it's a absolute like complete reduction of the fracture. It's anatomic, and um, and here you have it, a successful fixation of a lateral clavicle fracture. So in our uh, results, so we've done it in 16 patients uh, uh, and we had radiographic union in almost all patients, 15 out of 16. So only one patient was missed and that was due to a fall. So we had two recurrent falls in two patients. One of them had a fall and then had a refracture and we had to revise him by using the same technique, but then he was lost to follow up. So this guy is the number 16. Uh, but in the all other patients, we had complete union at 12 months. And uh, one patient also was, uh, had a fall and um, was managed non-operatively. And uh, in this patient, she had no displacement. And we could uh, manage her conservatively by just observation. And she ended up to have uh, union at 12 months. And so we had the improvement in ACS scores. They were 91.6% at 12 months. And uh, complications, uh, we had one shoulder stiffness, but we did not encounter any neurovascular injury. Uh, we were very careful when dis bluntly dissection over the coracoid, and it's done under radiographic guidance whenever you want to drill um, um, like through the coracoid, just to ensure we're in the right path. And uh, also no intraoperative complications, and um, we didn't have any loss of reduction during the 12-month follow-up except in the patients who fell. So it was uh, traumatic. So in this technique, it has been also reported by uh, another group. So uh, Dr. Robinson also published his results by using uh, suspensory fixation as well, which demonstrates that the technique works. Uh, so uh, this was done in 67 patients, and the follow-up was at about uh, five years. And uh, using uh, it, it basically was done by using uh, the same technique as we do it, but this was with a tight rope. So our technique is basically anchors. You can see the tight trope. You get an, uh, an endo button inferior to the coracoid and two on top. And uh, so uh, in their uh, results, they had only two symptomatic non-unions that requiring an operation and two fibrous uh, unions, uh, but that did not require an operation. So they concluded the five-year survival for this implant was 97%. So the technique does work. 
so in terms of complications, uh, you need to keep in mind a few things. We haven't encountered any of these, but certainly they, there have been reported. And uh, uh, you should be careful in terms of coracoid dissection just to avoid injury to nearby structures. Uh, coracoid fracture is a potential problem. That's why we use a small drill bit. Um, and uh, coracoid or clavicular osteolysis, certainly it can be seen, especially if you have micromotion uh, with your sutures. That can lead to that. And the construct stability of uh, a suture only fixation has been demonstrated in the literature to be inferior to plate in biomechanical studies. So um, that's another thing to keep in mind. So uh, in conclusion, uh, looking um, at this technique, so you need to keep in mind for all lateral clavicle fractures, you need first to determine implant uh, stability. Implant stability basically is determined by the fracture type. You look at one and three, the, these are non-operative. The fracture is lateral to the ligament, so you've got stability of the fracture. In type two and five, the fracture is medial to the ligaments or through one of the ligaments and disrupting them. And this requires operative treatment. And I always look at the patient characteristics. So if it's a young active patient, I tend to incline towards surgical treatment. And uh, if it's an older, lesser active sedentary kind of patient, I will I'll lean toward uh, non-operative uh, treatment. And of course, bear in mind as well, there is no single superior surgical option. There are trade-offs, there are pros and cons for everything. Most achieve bony union reliably, but always keep in mind, it's a fracture pattern kind of thing, surgeon preference, and also complication profile. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Abdul, for that brilliant presentation. Abdul, actually, you can stop sharing your screen. Sure. Yeah. And congratulations for your paper and, of course, the great work that you've done. Thank you. A couple of questions, uh, Abdul. Abdul, whether I, I don't know whether you've noticed this uh, publication called the UCAC approach, the under the coracoid and around the clavicle approach by Suleiman, and uh, he published in uh, the Born and John Journal in 2013. And where they have not used drill holes, and they have avoided the use of implants. They've just used fiber tapes. So what yes. is your take on that? Yeah, I've I've seen that. I've I've seen some surgeons do that, and there are certain reports, and they reported good uh, good outcomes. I mean, it can be done. It has been demonstrated by several surgeons that you can just no drilling any holes, just using simple stitches, wrapping around. It works, but uh, for me, it's um. I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable doing that. For me, I'm, I'm more leaning toward using implants that's through the coracoid and the clavicle to ensure you have maximum stability because we know through suture-based fixations, your main concern is that you have lesser biomechanical stability compared to the plates. And that's that's the main disadvantage in my opinion. So I, I tend toward drilling holes and making sure there is um, bony contact that is achieved by suture stability through having bony fixation. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And just an additional point is someone else has uh, again modified this particular approach and he coined the term as a parachute technique. Similar concept, use all sutures around and bring it to the clavicle. I mean, bring it to the coracoid. I mean, I think he's published in uh, IGO in 2019. Sharada from Manchester. Yes. So, so that's the thing with lateral clavicle fractures. I mean, if you're just gonna go through the literature, when I uh, when I wrote my paper, uh, you'll find a lot of techniques, a lot of modifications. You know, each each with pros and cons. So it's uh, the literature is very tricky and very poor because we don't have high quality evidence for this. Uh, unlike, for example, uh, let's say mid shaft displaced clavicle fractures. They have a ton of randomized trials on them, but when you go to this specific fracture pattern, it's more controversial. And I think it depends on what works in your hands, you know, and you have good outcomes and you've documented that and you keep using it. And uh, Abdul, in your technique, you always drill the coracoid, right? Yes. And, uh, and that's a very important. So what we do is that through the same incision, we bluntly dissect in, in the front and uh, on top of the coracoid. And usually we, we can see it sometimes. If not, I can feel it with my scissor. And I then I use a, a, drill, a drill guide and a drill bit, and I can feel I am top of bone. 
and then I do an X-ray. I always I, this is my technique is done by always CR C arm, and I make sure on the C arm I take one view, make sure I am just on top of it. I am not drifting lateral, not drift, I'm not drifting uh, medial, because the coracoids in many patients can be different, you know, and how they angulate and all that. So just to make sure you're right in right in the center, and then when I confirm that I drill. I take out and then I insert the anchor and that's it. Do you think there could be an advantage of uh, skipping the coracoid and just going under under the coracoid, avoiding drill holes? Because you know that if you put a drill hose, there's always a risk of a fracture, right? So do you that's, think there's an advantage for that, going under the coracoid? It has been done. It has been done. It has been reported with successful outcomes. Um, uh, for me, it's my personal bias. I like to drill the coracoid, you know? <laughs> Okay. But but it's certainly it has been done and it has been it has been demonstrated to be successful. Great. Uh, just one last question before I end of the session. Uh, now in the classification that uh, you mentioned in the first part, in a type two and the type five are potentially unstable fractures, right? So yes. and you always get an X-ray and a CT scan. And I think the biggest, uh, I mean, making a diagnosis because uh, conoid ligaments, trapezoid ligaments attached or disrupted, it's a pretty tricky one, isn't it? So do you really put into those classification subtypes or you just look at the degree of displacement? Okay, this is significantly displaced middle end of clavicle. So it could be either type two or type five. How do you go about it? So well, I don't do CT scans for these fractures, um, plain X-rays. I ensure I have a true trauma series, AP, just to exclude any fractures in the shoulder itself, other fractures, then AP clavicle, and uh, Zenka view sometimes, it can really uh, show you that displacement. And I, I don't really get bogged down onto the classification itself. I see if it's really unstable, there is displacement. Okay, that's that's an unstable fracture. It's usually obvious. If it is not that, it is very lateral and stable fracture, that's usually for me is an unoperative treatment. But I don't really get bogged down in the classification. The, the displacement is very dramatic when it's unstable. And in the center that you're currently working, do you take routine CT scans for lateral and clavicle? No. No. No, I, I don't do CT scans. It's just radiographic. Even, even in Baltimore? No, I, I haven't done them much here. You know, that in Qatar, we used to operate all the time. We had a lot of like motorcycle accidents and we had a lot of patients like this. So even there, and I don't think they do it here, like CT scan for the lateral end of clavicle specifically. I, th I, th I think in general, it's not as complex as a proximal humerus fracture where you really need to understand the fracture pattern. Um, it can show you the displacement probably much more accurately on a CT scan, but how clinically it is required. I but I think, think the point, the, one of the studies that you mentioned, the Chinese study where the uh, proximal end is displaced posteriorly, right? So that yes, is a yes. point, that is a technical tip that you said. So uh, always a CT scan is going to help you, isn't it? It could help if you have it like on a, a polytraumatized patient. I don't request it routinely. If it's there, it's helpful. But uh, this displacement that we uh, I indicated in the study, we just intraoperatively, when we used to fix them with plates, we just used to do plates initially. We see the fractures going posteriorly all the time. You know, it's like almost always. And this study kind of confirmed what we saw. And uh, this is why when we started doing them, uh, first, it was done by just coracoclavicular, but then later on, we added the acromioclavicular. Thank you, Abdul. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this wonderful presentation, and I'm sure it's going to benefit a lot of people. Uh, sure. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye.